Hello, and welcome to Julia Hodman History. In this episode, we're traveling to the heart of the Roman Empire. Amidst the opulence and grandeur of the ancient world, lived a woman whose life was marked by privilege, treachery, and the intricate threads of family bonds. Ania Aurelia Galeria Lucilla was the daughter of Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius and Empress Faustina the Younger. She was not merely a noblewoman, she was also the elder sister of Emperor Commodus, the despicable character immortalized in the blockbuster film Gladiator. Today, we are going to delve into Lucilla's life, exploring her transitions from a royal princess to wife and mother, her fateful marriages, and finally, the bloody political plots she led. To understand Lucilla's life, we must begin with her royal lineage. Her father, the mighty Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, and her mother, the illustrious Empress Faustina the Younger, provided her with a heritage of unparalleled magnificence. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus was Roman Emperor from 161 to 180 AD. He was a great general and a Stoic philosopher. He was the last of the rulers, later known as the Five Good Emperors and the last emperor of the Pax Romana, an age of relative peace, calm, and stability for the Roman Empire from 27 BC to 180 AD. Her mother, Faustina, was the youngest child of Emperor Antoninus Pius. Not much has survived from the Roman sources regarding Faustina's life, but what is available does not give a good report. Cassius Dio and the unreliable Historia Augusta accuse Faustina of ordering deaths by poison and execution, she has also been accused of instigating the revolt of Avidius Cassius against her husband. The Historia Augusta mentions adultery with sailors, gladiators, and men of rank, however, Faustina and Aurelius seem to have been very close and mutually devoted. The facts about the death of Faustina are not definite. She died in the winter of 175 at the military camp in Halala, a city in the Taurus Mountains in Cappadocia. The cause of her demise is a matter of speculation by scholars who have proposed various reasons, including natural causes, suicide, an accident, or even possibly assassination. Depending on the source, she may have come to a sticky end following the allegation of an affair with Cassius earlier that year. Beyond her noble birthright, Lucilla's life was etched into the annals of cinematic history in 2000. In Ridley Scott's epic film Gladiator, Danish actress Connie Nielsen played a character loosely inspired by Lucilla. Nielsen breathed life into this captivating woman, whose fate in the movie was to become entwined with the Hispano-Roman general Maximus Decimus Meridius, portrayed by Russell Crowe. However, that's all fiction. Now, we'll return to the pages of history. The real Lucilla embarked on a journey of matrimony at a remarkably tender age. In 164 CE, when she was just 14 years old, Lucilla married Lucius Verus, her father's co-ruler. Her husband, Lucius Aurelius Verus, was 18 years Lucilla's senior. Verus's shared rulership with Marcus Aurelius ushered in an era of unprecedented significance in the history of Rome. This was the first time the Roman Empire was governed by two emperors. A practice that would be replicated many times over, as the Roman Empire grew too large for one emperor to manage alone. On their wedding day, Lucius Verus would have led a magnificent procession to her father's house, where she would have been waiting, dressed in the traditional dress of a Roman bride, a tunic erector, a beautifully woven white gown, cinched with the intricate knot of Hercules, around her waist. Over her carefully arranged hair, she would have worn a flamium, a crimson wedding veil, rich in cultural and symbolic significance. To complete her ensemble, she wore red shoes, not merely for fashion, but to symbolize vitality and good fortune. As the marriage contract was solemnized, a lavish feast would have unfolded, culminating in a joyous procession to the couple's new abode, where Lucius Verus, would have carried her across the threshold for good luck. The marriage knot, or knot of Hercules, originated in ancient Egypt. 
It soon became best known as a symbol of weddings in the Roman world where it was incorporated into the protective girdles worn by brides and ceremonially untied by the groom on the wedding night. This custom likely gave rise to the phrase tying the knot, as it was tied by the bride's father before the wedding. In Roman law, the knot symbolized the legendary fertility of the god Hercules and the power of the girdle of Diana, which she captured from the Amazon queen, Hippolyta. Both Diana and Hercules represented the moon, the ancient emblem of love and fertility. With this marriage, Lucilla's life underwent a profound transformation. She ascended to the prestigious rank of Augusta, donning the mantle of a Roman empress and thus reaching the zenith of her societal standing. Lucilla was no ordinary bride. At the tender age of 14, she embarked on a journey that was in many ways the norm for a woman of her class, in the Roman world. But, she was an empress. Even so, such unions often ended in tragedy, as the mortality rate among young aristocratic women and infants was alarmingly high. Even today, teenage pregnancies come with heightened risks. But Lucilla defied the odds, bringing five children into the world. Among them was Aurelia Lucilla, born in 165, in Antioch. She had another daughter, Lucilla Plautia, and a son named Lucius Verus. Tragically, life had its cruel twists. Aurelia's two other children died in their youth. Her husband, Lucius Verus, spent the early years of their marriage campaigning in the Iranian highlands of Mesopotamia. Upon his return to Rome, he continued the glamorous life of a bachelor. He surrounded himself with actors and favorites. He even had a tavern built at home, where he reveled with friends, until the early hours. Sometimes he courted danger. He was known to go wandering through the city incognito, mingling with the people. He spent his time at the games, and at the hippodrome watching and no doubt gambling on chariot racing. The Stoic philosopher, Marcus Aurelius, disapproved of his son-in-law's lifestyle. But as Vera sufficiently carried out his official duties, this left the older and more serious man with no room for criticism. In 168, Lucius Verus joined his father-in-law on the northern border, at Aquileia, to fight the Germanic tribes attacking the empire. In 169, a plague broke out, and both emperors decided to return to Rome. Unfortunately, for Lucius Verus, he seems to have caught the deadly disease on the journey back to Rome. The state of relations between the two emperors led some contemporaries to question the nature of his death, suspecting foul play. Rumors swirled, implicating the family, including his mother-in-law Faustina and his wife Lucilla, in a possible plot. These dark whispers suggested that a secret relationship between Verus and Faustina had led to his demise. Yet, there's no solid evidence to support these claims. It's more likely that Lucius Verus succumbed to the Antonine Plague, possibly smallpox. Regardless of the family's feelings and their growing differences, Lucius Verus was publicly mourned. Emperor Marcus organized grand games in his son-in-law's honor, a tribute to their shared history. Verus's ashes were placed in Emperor Hadrian's mausoleum, now known as the Castel Sant'Angelo. And, in accordance with tradition, the Senate declared Lucius Verus a god, to be worshipped as Divus Verus. As we continue the saga of Anya Aurelia Galeria Lucilla, her life takes yet another unexpected turn. After the untimely death of Lucius Verus in 169, her father orchestrated a second marriage for her. This time, it was to the aged Tiberius Claudius Pompeianus, a Syrian Roman general, renowned for his valor in Rome's conflicts against the Parthians and the Marcomanni. When Marcus Aurelius died in 180 AD, while on campaign in the Northern Territories, his 18-year-old son Commodus was proclaimed emperor. Lucilla was now in her prime. She and her new husband tried to persuade Commodus to remain on the Danubian frontier to complete the conquest of the Marcomanni. But Commodus had no stomach for war and returned to Rome in the autumn of 180. Back in Rome Commodus devalued the currency, making everyone poorer. 
and inflating his own wealth. The relationship between the young emperor and his elder sister and her husband quickly deteriorated. Cassius Dio, a first-hand witness, describes Commodus as, not naturally wicked, but, on the contrary, as guileless as any man that ever lived. The historian Herdian, also a contemporary, described Commodus as an extremely handsome man, who loved to portray himself as Hercules, with a lion's hide and a club. In fact, he had many statutes made of himself in this guise. He thought of himself as the reincarnation of the hero Hercules, frequently emulating the legendary hero's feats by appearing in the arena to fight wild animals. Because he was the emperor, efforts would have been made to ensure none of the animals he fought stood a chance of injuring or killing him. According to Herodian, spectators at the arena thought it unbecoming of an emperor to take up arms in the amphitheater for sport when he should be campaigning against the barbarians, banging against the borders of Rome. The consensus was that it was below his office to participate as a gladiator. Popular rumors spread, alleging he was not actually the son of Marcus Aurelius, but instead was the son of a gladiator his mother Faustina had taken as a lover at the coastal resort of Caeta. In the arena, Commodus' opponents always submitted to the emperor, as a result he never lost. Cassius Dio claimed that citizens of Rome who had lost their feet through accident or illness were rounded up and taken to the arena, where they were tethered together for Commodus to club to death. For each appearance in the arena, he charged the city of Rome a million sesterces, straining the Roman economy. Commodus, it seems, was a cruel, cowardly, imprudent, proud and deluded young man. In 182, Lucilla decided Rome would be a better place without her cruel and dim-witted brother on the throne. She hatched a plot to have her brother killed with her lover Tiberius Quintianus, the husband of her eldest daughter, Aurelia. Quintianus was one of Commodus' inner circle and one of his drinking buddies. And so was the one chosen to perform the fatal act. The accounts of the assassination attempt are consistent. The plot was for Quintianus to stab Commodus on the way to the amphitheatre. It should have been a straightforward affair. However, instead of silently stabbing Commodus at the appointed moment, Quintianus rushed at the emperor shouting, This is what the Senate is sending you. Thus warning the emperor's guards of what was about to happen. Quintianus was overpowered, and the emperor's life was saved. Commodus showed no mercy. He executed Quintinanus and banished Lucilla and her family to the island of Capri. There they lived under house arrest for a year. Until, one day, a centurion from Rome arrived and killed them all. Lucilla's tale has transcended the annals of history, making its mark in popular culture. In 1964, Sophia Loren's portrayal of Lucilla in The Fall of the Roman Empire mesmerized audiences, bringing her story to life on the silver screen. In 2016, Tiber Dinner Blades brought her character to a new generation in the docuseries Roman Empire, Reign of Blood. These adaptations, while taking creative liberties, continue to fuel curiosity about the lives of remarkable women from the past ensuring that Lucilla's legacy endures. From her noble birth to her cinematic avatars and tumultuous marriages, her story is a testament to the captivating narratives that history and fiction can weave together. Join me next time as I explore more captivating tales from the annals of time.